This video is for students in Mrs. Brand's third grade, and we are going to pick up where we had left off in our book, Wish, by Barbara O'Connor. Um, we are very close to the end. I think we need about two more readings, and we will be through this one. So this is for Mrs. Brand's third grade. I will later upload the end of the book for Mrs. Twilliger's class, but stay away from that until... Uh, next week when we get the ending of this one up for Mrs. Brand's third grade. So here we go. Um, when we left off, Jackie had come to visit and um, she had been at um, in Colby with Charlie and um, Bertha and Gus and she was getting ready now to go back home to Raleigh and um, Charlie was feeling a little sad that her sister was going to be leaving. So they were in home in bed. Char uh, Jackie had packed up her things, and they were laying in bed, getting ready. What's going to happen to me? I wanted to ask her, but I didn't. So after we turned out the lights, I stared up at the ceiling. I watched the shadows of the dogwood tree dance in the moonlight, and then I took a deep breath and said, Can I go back to Raleigh with you? The silence that followed nearly swallowed me up. I could feel my heart beat in my chest and wishbones warm breath against my cheek. And then Jackie got out of bed, and she sat on my sleeping bag. Nothing's going to change, Charlie, she said. I used to think that it would, but now I don't. Scrappy is going to keep being Scrappy, and Mama's going to keep being Mama, and you and I are on our own. No magic wand is going to fix things. I didn't want to believe that, so I pushed those words away so I wouldn't have to think about them. And then I said, did you know Mama left us when we were little? She just ran off with a garbage bag of clothes to start a new life. Jackie heaved a big sigh. Yeah, I did know that. How'd you know? Well, when you're seven years old and your mama waltzes out the door without so much as a goodbye, well, that's something you don't forget. How come you never told me, I said. She put her hand on my back and she rubbed it in little circles. Because I didn't want you to hate mama, she said. Do you hate mama? Nah, she pushed her hair behind her ear. I don't like her very much, but I don't hate her. Why can't I live with you, I asked, so quiet it was almost a whisper. Jackie hugged her knees. Charlie... I can't live with Carol Lee forever. I'm saving my money, and me and Wileen Jarvis are getting an apartment together, and I can't take of you, care of you like Gus and Bertha can. She said, shoot, I can barely take care of myself. We sat in the silence for a minute, and then Jackie said, you've got a good life here, Charlie. You've got Gus and Bertha loving you and treating you like a princess. you got all them Odoms thanking the good Lord for you. And then there's Howard, the nicest friend you could ever want. You got these beautiful mountains and a garden and a porch to sit on that's like sitting on the side of heaven. Wishbone kicked his legs and let out a little wolf like he was having a doggy dream. Jackie rubbed his stomach. And that dog loves you like nobody's business. I looked at Wishbone. I thought about Bertha saying how dogs loved you no matter what. And my heart nearly burst. Don't hate me, Charlie, Jackie said. Hate her? I loved everything about her. I loved the old Jackie and the new Jackie. Why couldn't I tell her that? So I guess I hadn't had much practice saying I love you. So I just sat there in the darkness with Wishbone, twitching in his sleep beside me, and I said, I do like those blue streaks in your hair. All right. So I have a quick question that I'd like to ask you. When Charlie's sister Jackie comes to visit, Charlie wants to go back with Raleigh to Raleigh with her, but she can't do that. Why? So I want you to think about that question. You may stop the video if you want, and when you've thought about it or talked about it, you can start the video back up. All right. Chapter 24. The week after the Jackie left, I started vacation Bible school at the Rocky Creek Baptist Church. I told Bertha I didn't want to go, but she kept telling me how much I was going to love it. I went, to vacation, the, I went to vacation Bible school every summer when I was a girl. She said, I loved everything about it. The games, the crafts, the songs. She went on and on telling me about making a bird feeder by putting peanut butter on a pine cone and rolling it in bird seed. And lanyards, I must have made about a hundred lanyards. She laughed and shook her head. And macrame keychains, I love those. And she said, Howard and all the kids from school, they'll be there. So I finally said, okay. And then the day before I was supposed to go, Bertha came home with a lunchbox covered with ponies and rainbows. I can't believe I let you take your lunch to school in that ugly old paper bag, she said. Well, I can't take it in that, I said. 
Bertha's smile faded. Oh, she said, oh, okay. I could tell I hurt her feelings. There was no way I could take that lunchbox. Bertha snatched it off the kitchen counter, and she stuck it way up on the top shelf of the cupboard. I don't know what I was thinking. She said, that thing's just plain old silly. So she put my lunch in a brown paper bag, and off I went to vacation Bible school. We sat in a circle in the shade, and we listened to Miss Rhonda tell us how much fun we were going to have. Even though we knew each other from Sunday school, she said, first, I'd like each of you to tell us your name, and then three of fun facts about yourself. Right away, I thought of back to my first day of school in Colby in that getting-to-know-you paper. But this time, when it was my turn, instead of saying I like soccer, ballet, and fighting, I said, I have a dog named Wishbone. My sister works at the Waffle House, and my Aunt Bertha has seven cats. We spent the morning making paper mache bowls and singing a song about Moses and the bull rushes, and then it was time for lunch. So I got my brown paper bag out and I sat next to Audrey Mitchell. I made up my mind I was going to be more like Jackie from now on. Cool and confident, making friends left and right. But before I could think up something to say, Audrey, to Audrey, Howard plopped down next to me. Bro wrote Jackie a letter, I said. What for? Or he said, what for? He shrugged. Lenny snatched it right out of his hand and they got in a big fight and Burl chased him around the house, cussing and they broke a lamp. He lifted the corner of a sandwich to examine the bologna and mustard inside. Did Burl get his letter back, I asked. Howard flattened his sandwich between his palms of his hands. Yeah, he said, but it got ripped and now they're both grounded because of the cussing and the lamp. He pushed at his damp red hair. His arms were sunburned, bright pink, and dotted with freckles. He went on to tell me about Dwight breaking his pinky finger at baseball camp. While Howard talked, I watched Audrey out of the corner of my eye. She sat cross-legged with a paper napkin in her lap, and she had butterfly barrettes in her hair, and her sneakers didn't have one speck of dirt on them. Her lunchbox was plain, no ponies or rainbows on it. She opened it and looked inside, and then she took out a plastic bag full of grapes, something wrapped in foil, and a folded-up piece of paper. I scooted a little closer to her and pretended like I was listening to Howard while she opened that paper. It was a note with big, swirly handwriting. And then she put it on the grass next to her grapes. I squinted at it, trying to read it. And Cotton had two ticks on him, Howard said. So Mama made him strip down naked right there in the yard. A couple kids giggled, and I shot Howard a look. Nobody wanted to hear the word naked while they were eating their lunch. But Howard went right on talking like he didn't even notice me. Just then, some girl I didn't know said, Sit here, Audrey. And she patted the ground next to her. So Audrey scooped up her grapes and stuff, and she moved away from me and Howard, leaving that piece of paper behind. Right away, I slapped my foot down on top of it. While Audrey and the girl chatted about swimming lessons and soccer camp, I stuffed that paper in my pocket. What was that? Howard asked. What was what? That paper. What paper? The paper in your pocket? Nothing. Howard wiped a dab of mustard on his shorts. Okay, he said. All afternoon, while we read Bible stories out loud and watched Miss Rhonda's teenage son do magic tricks, I thought about the note in my pocket. Every once in a while, I reached in and I wrapped my fingers around it. Finally, I got my chance. Howard was helping Miss Rhonda take the Bible story books back inside the church, and Audrey was busy being friends with everybody but me. So I took that paper out of my pocket and I read it. Have fun at vacation Bible school. I'll be missing you. I love you very much, Mom. Quickly, I folded it and jammed it back in my pocket. I looked over, and Audrey was linking arms with some girl and whispering. I closed my eyes, and in my mind, I became Audrey, a girl with perfect sneakers and a friend to whisper secrets to, and a mama who wrote, I love you very much, on a note for me. Then I opened my eyes, and it was just me again. That night, we had corn on the cob for supper, and I counted the rows of corn on my cob, and I couldn't believe it exactly 14. That was on my list of things you could wish for. I counted one more time to make sure, and then I closed my eyes, and I made my wish. Oh, I almost forgot, Bertha said, jumping up from the table, and she took something off the counter and handed it to me. A lunchbox. A lun plain lunchbox with no ponies or rainbows, and she lifted her eyebrows. What do you think? Better? A wave of guilt slept, swept over me and caught me by surprise. I felt bad that Bertha had spent money to buy another lunchbox for me. I should have just taken the one with the rainbows and ponies and been thankful for it. I bet Jackie would have. But I hadn't, and now here was Bertha being so nice to me. Yes, ma'am, I said thank you. And then we went on the porch and we tossed a tennis ball to Wishbone till he got tired and he went to sleep at my feet. As I watched the sun sink low, Behind the mountain, I cupped my hand around that note in my pocket, and I thought about Audrey's mother putting those grapes in that little bag and writing that note, and I wondered what Audrey's family was like, the one she had written on her flower for the Garden of Blessings at church. 
I knew for sure her daddy wasn't away somewhere getting corrected. And I bet she and her sister, she had a sister who played cards with her on rainy days and whispered secrets under the covers at night. And I was certain that her mama had her feet on the ground. And when it got dark and the mosquitoes came out, me and Wishbone went back to my room. I fished around my backpack until I found a piece of paper and a pen. I tore that paper in half and I sat on the floor and I wrote, I love you very much, mama. And then I folded that paper and I tucked it under my pillow before turning out the light and kissing Wishbone on the top of his head. All right, I'm going to ask you another quick question. Um, on the first day of vacation Bible school, Charlie takes a note that classmate Audrey put in her lunch box from her, from, from her mother. Why does she do that? I want you to think about that. Why would Audrey take, or Charlie take Audrey's lunchbox note? And um, think on that. You can stop the video if you want. And then when you're ready to start back reading, you may turn it back on again. All right. We are going to start chapter 25. The next day at Bible school, we made bottle cap magnets with the Ten Commandments on them, and then we played some game where we had to wrap ourselves in strips of crepe paper like Joseph's coat of many colors and race around the obstacle course. I guess Miss Rhonda didn't remember about Howard and his up-down walk when she thought up that game. He came in last, and he ripped his coat of many colors. They didn't seem to care. At lunch, we sat in the shade, and we took out our lunch boxes. Howard was helping Miss Rhonda gather up the crepe paper strips, so I plopped myself down next to Audrey. Hey, I said. Hey, said Ra Audrey, and then she scooted closer to a girl named Lainey, who had scabs all over her legs. I couldn't believe it. She'd rather sit closer to a scabby-legged girl than me. I guess she did. I told her I was sorry about kicking and shoving, hadn't I? I didn't know what else I could do to make friends with her. I opened my new lunchbox, and I took out the things that Bertha had packed for me. A bagel with peanut butter, strawberries in a margarine tub, some cookies she made that were kind of burnt on the bottom. And then I looked at that note I had written the night before, the one that said, I love you very much, Mama. I opened it, and I held it out in front of me, and then I cleared my throat so that maybe Audrey would look my way and see that paper, but she was busy stirring her yogurt. So I tossed the paper on the grouse, almost in front of her. You dropped your trash, she said. What? That's your trash, and she pointed to the paper. You mean that note? She shrugged. Whatever. Oh, it's from my mama, I said, rolling my eyes. She's all the time doing that, and I nudged the paper a little closer to her so that maybe she'd read it. I thought you lived with your aunt and uncle, she said. Well, not all the time. I mean, most of the time, but my mama comes to visit a lot, and she's always writing these notes. I knew my face was beet red, so I kept my eyes on the ground. Audrey made a face. You're not supposed to lie at vacation Bible school, she said. And she said the word Bible real loud and mean sounding. And before I knew it, I was standing over her with my fist balled up and my heart beating like crazy. I felt red hot anger settle over me like a blanket. And I wanted to stomp on her perfect sneakers. I wanted to yank those butterfly barrettes out of her hair. But then Howard came up from behind me and said, pineapple, pineapple, pineapple. Audrey grabbed her yogurt and lunchbox and stood up. Y'all are crazy, she said. And she stormed off to the church. What the heck, Charlie, Howard said. Are you going to smack somebody at church? I dropped down to the grass and I began throwing my bagel and stuff into my lunch bags. Lunchbox. Howard sat by me. Why are you so mad? She said I lied. Did you? No. I snatched that stupid note up and I tossed it in my lunchbox. He looked at me over the top of his glasses the way some grown-ups did. Well, then there's no reason to get mad. He looked into my lunchbox. Are you going to eat that bagel? Took me a while to simmer down, but I finally did. Still, I sure wasn't in the mood to memorize Bible verses. And it was almost time to go. Miss Rhonda told us to go inside and help set up the chairs for Sunday school. As Howard made his way toward the church, T.J. Rayner followed behind him, walking up and down, like up, walking in an up-down way like Howard. He looked around to make sure everybody was watching, with a big old grin on his face, like he was the funniest person in the universe. Suddenly, Howard turned around, but T.J. didn't even stop. He kept walking toward Howard, up, down, up, down, up, down, and then I couldn't believe my eyes. Howard just turned back around and went on his way like nothing even happened. Well, I can tell you for sure, there weren't enough pineapples in the world to keep me from running straight at TJ full steam ahead. I kept my arms stiff in front of me and bam, I shoved him so hard his head snapped back and he crashed face first into the dirt. 
I confess I was a little more than surprised when he got right back up and shoved me back, knocking me to the ground. So I scrambled to my feet and I was ready to haul off and bust him one when Miss Rhonda stepped between me and TJ with her fist jammed on her waist with a look of pure horror on her face. Stop it right now, she hollered. This is not Bible school behavior. So that's how I ended up sitting in a church pew with TJ Rayner, listening to Miss Rhonda talk about forgiveness and kindness and goodness and grace and all that stuff. It seemed to me like Audrey Mitchell ought to be sitting there with her perfect sneakers while Miss Rhonda quoted stuff about doing unto others. Every once in a while, TJ shot me a glare, but I shot him one right back. When Bertha came to pick me up, Miss Rhonda had to go and tell her what happened. Bertha nodded and said, Oh, dear, and yes, ma'am, and I will. And then we rode home in silence. Mama would have been hollering at me, asked me what in the world was wrong with me, and can I go one darn day without causing trouble? But not Bertha. She reached over and she patted my knee and she said, You are a good friend to Howard, Charlie. When we got home, me and Miss Wishbone went out front and sat in the shade of a dogwood tree. The air was still and hot. The red dirt yard was dry and dusty and Bertha's nestoriums by the front door spilled over the sides of the flower pots and drooped onto the ground. The sprinkler sputtered in circles out in the garden, leaving glistening drops of water dripping off the okra and settling in little pools inside the yellow flowers of the cucumber plants. When I'd first gotten to Colby, most of that garden had just been rows of tiny green plants poking out of the ground, but now plump red tomatoes grew fatter every day, yellow flowers turned into bright green zucchini, and pole beans hung in clusters from the vines that snaked up twine to form leafy teepees. A blue jay landed in the yard near us, and Wishbone's ears perked up. He cocked his head, and he watched that bird hop in and out of the marigolds along the fence. I put my arm around him, and I rubbed his long, velvety ears between my fingers. He licked my face, and his tail swished back and forth on the dusty ground. I swear that dog loves you to pieces, Bertha kept telling me. And I do believe it was true. He'd gotten to where he wouldn't let me out of his sight. Follow me around from room to room, lay in my chair at the kitchen table, sleeping with his head on my feet in the porch. I didn't even need to keep him on a leash out in the yard anymore. He stayed right by my side everywhere I went. He might trot over to sniff a shrub or snap at a bumblebee on the clover by the porch, but he always glanced back to make sure I was still there, and every time he did that, I loved him more. After a while, Bertha came outside and brought us saltine crackers with peanut butter. She let Wishbone eat one right out of her hand and didn't even care when he slobbered on her. Then out of the clear blue sky, she said, Charlie, I really admire you for sticking up for Howard like you did today. Admired me? <laughs> well, that was a first. I was pretty sure nobody on this earth had ever admired me before. You do, I said. She nodded. I do. And so we sat there in the shade of the dogwood while the sun beat down in the dirt yard and Bertha told me a story about when she and Mama were little girls and went to the lake one summer. Carla had never been in water deeper than bathtub in her life, Bertha said. So when she fell off that dock into the murky water, everybody went crazy. But I swear she popped right up like a cork without so much as a sputter. And then she just floated on her back, staring up at the sky while everybody ran around the dock and hollered and carried on. And my Uncle Jared jumped in right after her and ruined his brand new wristwatch. Bertha chuckled and swatted at the gnats that were hovering over Wishbone as he slept. That girl was a walking wonder sometimes. Of course, I couldn't help but ask myself how a woman who couldn't get out of bed and get her feet on the ground could be a walking wonder, but I was still basking in the glow of being admired. So for once, I kept quiet and I didn't mess things up. And one time, Bertha went on, she sniffed all the buttons off my blouses. She cut the air with her fingers like scissors. Snip, 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 right off onto the floor. But what'd she do that for? Beats the heck out of me, she said. She did the craziest things you ever saw. She reached over suddenly and grabbed my knee. Well, not crazy crazy, just, you know, kind of, well, odd. She let go of my knee and went back to swatting the gnats away from Wishbone. About the only thing I remember our poor mama ever saying was, Carla, stop that. I nodded and I had a perfect picture of my mind, in my mind, of a little Carla snipping those buttons. Snip, sniff, sniff. Before long, Gus's car came dancing in the squeaky driveway. Hey, Butterbean, he called out the window. And then he got out and kissed Bertha on the cheek, patted Wishbone on the head, and told me I was the ray of sunshine at the long of a, end of a long, sorry day. That night I went to bed and I laid on top of the cool sheets with Wishbone's soft, warm body next to me. And I thought about my broken family back in Raleigh, and I wondered if they were thinking about me. A ray of sunshine at the end of a long, sorry day. Chapter 26 What's that? 
Audrey Mitchell pointed to my hand as we played Bible Bingo in the Fellowship Hall. It had been raining all morning, so we hadn't been able to go outside and have a balloon race like Mrs. R Miss Rhonda had planned for us to do. I looked down at the drawing I had done on the back of my hand with a pen. It was a blackbird in a cage. I, oh, it was a blackbird in a cage, I said, flipping my hair the way Jackie does. Audrey screwed up her face like she'd just seen a dead possum squash flat in the middle of the road. Check it out, I said, thrusting my hand toward her face and winking. I've been trying to do all the things Jackie does, flipping my hair and winking, acting cool and confident, but so far, didn't seem to be working. Most of those kids at Bible school still treated like me, me like I had cooties. What's it for, Audrey said. And then the darndest thing that happened, I guess being a ray of sunshine had given me some real confidence, not pretend confidence, because I looked her square in the eye and I said, it's the same tattoo my daddy has on his hand. The minute those confident words came out, old Mr. Doubt tapped me on my shoulder and said, now look what you've done. She's going to ask you where your daddy is, and then what are you going to say? But miracle of miracles, Audrey didn't ask me where my dad was. She just said, oh studied her Bible bingo card. So I pushed Mr. Down aside and I said, his name is Scra Scrappy and he's getting corrected. Audrey put down another token on her bingo card. What does that mean? She asked. It means he's getting corrected, I said. He'll be home any day now. So then are you going to go back to Raleigh? She said. At that, Howard's head shot up from studying his bingo card and he stared at me. Um, yeah, I said, sure. When? Howard said. I shrugged. I don't know. However long it takes, it takes for Scrappy to get corrected, I guess. Suddenly my confidence began to spin out of control faster and faster until it rose right up through the ceiling and out of that the roof of that rocky Creek Baptist church disappearing into the sky and leaving me there in the fellowship hall with a stomach ache. I licked my thumb and I wiped that blackbird tattoo off, leaving a smudgy black spot on my hand. Suddenly somebody called, Bingo! Miss Rhonda clapped her hands and pointed to the table full of prizes, coloring books and glittery pens, erasers, shaped like Noah Ark, Noah's Ark. Clear your cards, Miss Rhonda said. Let's start a new game. Later that day, me and Howard sat on Odom's front porch steps, watching Wishbone and Cotton playing in the sprinkler. Cotton jumped over puddles of muddy water while Wishbone scampered along behind him, ears flapping and tail wagging. I've been wondering about something, Howard said, scratching the mosquito bites on his leg. How come you shoved TJ at Bible school yesterday? What do you mean, I asked. I mean, why'd you shove him? He was making fun of you, Howard. I know. I stared at him. His eyebrows were squeezed together over his glasses, and he looked so serious. For a minute, I almost laughed, but then he said, he was making fun of me, not you. Then you're the one that should have shoved him, I said. No. Nah. Why not, I said. Why do you let kids make fun of you? And you don't do one darn thing about it. Because I'd be shoving somebody every day of my life. So? So what good's that? We sat in silence for a few minutes. Cotton was stomping in the mud and Wishbone was snapping in the water, swirling out of the sprinkler. But why'd you shove TJ, Howard asked. Because he was being mean to you, I wiped the muddy water off my leg. Duh, I added. Why do you care about that? Because you're my friend, I said, and I don't like kids to be mean to my friends, okay? I'm your friend? Sure you are, I said. Duh, I added again. I am? Well, yeah. Then my wish came true. It did? Yeah, Howard blushed a little, his white freckly face turning pale pink. Well, part of it anyway. I wish two things. So since one of them has come true, I can tell it to you. I wish that we'd be friends. Well, dang, I never would have guessed that. You'd think a redheaded boy with glasses who was named Howard and had an up-down walk would have had a lot more to wish for than being friends with me. But I admit, I felt a smile on my face and hope in my heart, because maybe wishes really do come true. Maybe some wishes just take longer than others. And that is where we're going to stop today. And we will start back up maybe next week. So that was the end, um, some more reading of Wish for um, Mrs. Brand's third grade. I believe the next time we read, we will get through the end of the book. Thank you.